hui pu i ki ea wā e i ka lā, e walao e pili ana ki ea me ano pili ki ea e pili ana you know ke kahakai paha you know so anyway all I'm saying is that thanks for all gathering here to discuss or talk about you know the beach the ocean and stuff like that really appreciate you guys actually coming here and I don't mean to just, yeah, I do mean to grab the mic. But anyway, I kind of alluded in the other panel to, you know, my time away from surfing. Um, and that kind of leads up to where everything starts to happen because I actually walk away from surfing for that period in time on the North Shore because of the first pipe contest that Fred Hemmings and Randy Rarick put on that was, that was shot and uh, with ABC Wide World of Sports. And that was kind of one of the grounding factors, you know, not the, but one of them, when there was a confrontation on that beach because I was surfing. When I lost my board, Fred grabbed my board and I swam in and he told me I had to get out of the water and I couldn't surf here. And I basically excused my colorful language. I told him, fuck you. And you know, I told him, hey, you, give, you know, give my board, I'm gonna knock you out. And that's that. So him and Randy and I, you know, just got into a you know, shouting match. I took my board, they said they're gonna call the cops. I said, go call the cops, who cares? And I paddled back out. And I told him, have your contest, I'll go right. And so that leads to a lot of issues down the road because there was a claim by Sean Thompson that they were the first people to go right a pipe. Sorry, got photographs of it. And then uh, what happens is all the boys follow, right? Everybody else follows suit. And we just pretty much surf pipe. And we were doing that for the first couple of years until altercations started happening. And it was when I got to the point and I, and I ended up uh, holding a bunch of people hostage by gunpoint and you know, shooting one of them and stuff like that that I realized that I was pretty much pissed off at the whole surfing world, and it wasn't a place for me anymore. And going to prison and then coming out, I realized that I couldn't go back to this place because it wasn't the same anymore. Everything had changed. The, you know, the surfing contests had moved in. There was a lot of uh, anger from us as natives, native peoples. And I didn't think it was a good place for me to be because I had sort of an uncontrollable anger. Uh, when, you, when you pull a trigger, right, you can never go back. Right? It's a one-way street. So you have to find a way to control yourself. And I was trained to do that, right? Because, you know, in 69, I volunteered for Vietnam at the closing years. I, I literally just went in and volunteered I wouldn't take oath of allegiance, but they said, oh, you're the perfect guy, because they asked me, why do you want to go? I said, I just want to go kill people, and that's that. And I didn't, I didn't have an agenda at all. And it was that attitude that they trained me to go do in the jungles. And so when I came back, that attitude was still with me. And uh, you know, it, it just permeated to a higher level because of you know watching that that uh, invasion of our, of our waters and the attitudes that came with it. So it's sort of like my journey. So I took that journey away from surfing long enough to realize that I needed some sort of anger management. And you know, I was requested by the court to go take some anger management. And so someone just said, hey, you should take some martial arts. And I went, oh, perfect. You know, I just increased my ability to kick ass, right? But I was really humbled when I started to take martial arts because my first week in Aikido, and I've been doing Aikido for quite a while, is an 11-year-old girl, 12-year-old girl, just kicked my ass every night. She just dropped me on the ground. And my sensei said, you know, it's a way of learning to be humble. 
And I started to realize that we lacked, or I lacked, that sense of humility, or ha ha as we call it. I didn't know how to be humble because I was allowing my ego to take hold of myself rather than myself taking care of my ego. And so it wasn't until about 1988 when the boys kidnapped me, threw me in a boat, took my car keys, you know, you know my truck, I was, I was uh, ocean rescue. So they took the car keys and said they're gonna throw them in the ocean unless I get in the boat. So basically I got in the boat, drove out, you know, they took us out to some, you know, a surf spot, I'm not gonna tell you, and it was fabulous. The surf was awesome, 46 foot, perfect waves. And I said, hey man, I don't wanna surf. You know, I'm over it. And I was already doing something else. I was like, I was a professional windsurfer. I was fifth in the world, right, at, at that time. And I sat there in the boat for almost two hours. And that's what they told me, you can just sit in the boat. Then. And it was hot, no shade. And I finally just went, I'm over it. I got in the water, paddled out. And by the end of the day, I had to thank them. When I returned to the North Shore, I realized that the surf was still there. He had mentioned something about lineups. I still had my place in the lineup. I wasn't part of the, the surfing competition, but I was part of surfing itself. And I had never left it. And, you know, I paddled right out the pipe. And, you know, I restarted my life in surfing again. But what was, you know, that, that wasn't a, you know, that was a journey. And that journey is based on our origins. And our origins, we have always been on a journey. We left the continents approximately 30,000 years ago. And we never looked back. And, we, and we, we evolved. We became ocean people. And the ocean, no matter what I was doing or where I was, was home. Anywhere. Anywhere in the world. And, and a side note to what Isaiah was talking about and, and Cook, because I believe for us as Native peoples, this idea of localism comes from Cook's arrival. Very few people know that Cook had a standing order by the crown, non-interference with the Native peoples he comes in contact with. That was a standing order that he broke. Every place he went, with the, ex with the exception of Hawaii, or maybe he did, but he killed a native person in the Pacific. And so, you know, the attitude of looking at us as stealing things was only because we saw what he had, and that was the metal that we, that we had, you know, knowledge of due to ship, shipwrecks from, you know, the Spanish that were wandering the Pacific before the English were, and everybody else. So, his effort to take a god backfired, and that's why he was killed. Because he came to touch a god, and you can't touch a god, right? And the god was Colonial Pu'u, who was the high chief of, the, of Hawaii Island. <clears throat> oh, and sorry, he did. He did kill a Hawaiian. And that was on his first arrival in 1778 at Waimea, Kauai. And that was Kapopupu. And so that chief was the one Kael sent out to meet Cook. And eventually, he was killed. Cook killed him, right? And so that's, you know, at that point, Cook leaves and, and then he returns in uh, 1779. But a lot of, you know, a lot of anger has built up over this period of time with, with non-natives. And as Isaiah had put it, you know, the concept of haole, or haole, is just, it's, it's to all foreigners of Hawaii, and it's not meant as a derogatory thing. It's meant to, to express the fact is that he didn't know how to greet us, and we didn't understand the handshake. And so we had no concept of that. And our resistance and to, to this influx of, you know, early surfing attitudes you know, there were a lot of Australians that came to Hawaii before professional surfing contests arrived. You know, one, for example, is Terry Fitzgerald. And Terry, you remember, right? Terry Fitzgerald 
was one of the most humblest Australian guys I ever met. And not only was he humble, but he surfed unreal. And that's what he did. He just came to surf, and he surfed with us. And, you know, that's, that's just one name of, of, of many surfers that came. But, you know, the North Shore changed, you know, and it has changed, and the islands have changed, and we're angry. But there's different ways of going about it. And in my part of it, I look at it as a fact is I can still be out there or, well, probably be dead today. But I could have stayed out there pounding heads, and I was good at it, right? I was a small guy, but I had attitude. And, and I backed it up. Not a problem. I don't care how big you were, I'm going to take you down. Because, you know, you, you know, you learn things along the way. But with that said, the problem that bothered us, or me the most, is assimilation. And I looked around and realized that in our own community, people are saying, oh, when the Hawaiians did this, this is Hawaiians talking, or when the Hawaiians did that. And I always looked at people and went, what are you talking about? Aren't you native? Aren't you on Hawaiian? And they go, oh, but you know, I'm talking about, well, you're talking about our kupuna, our, our, our ancestors. Yes, what they did. But you got to remember, and what I try to express wherever I go, is that we've had 30,000 years of this, and it just doesn't disappear in 200 years. It can't. It's impossible. It's built into us. And that sense of assimilation was to remove us from that. And that's why Isaiah and I have been talking about this, because that's a point where our language is banned, and we don't have the rights to our language again until the 1980s. It's finally taken off the books as outlawed. And then comes acculturation of our traditions. You know, for example, tiki culture, right? There was no such thing as tiki culture in a way. I mean, that originates out of, out of here, you know? Tiki culture spreads across the Pacific and everybody looks at us. And the whole fact is that we call our club Hui O He Nalu, right? Which we do because the Hui Nalu name is with another organization. But the Hui Nalu, of which Duke and the Beach Boys are part of, are, are, they are, in essence, a resistance at that era in time because they're being utilized to promote the fledgling tourism business in Hawaii. And that's what they're used for. They weren't up in the club, right? It was only for white people only. They were down below, underneath the club. And when they wanted a native to be there, they called Duke. And Duke was gracious enough to share his aloha because he felt, and I did, spend time as a youth with, with, with Papa Duke and all the other beach boys and learn to surf with them and I surfed the wood boards and everything. But what he was doing, because I remember him and a lot of other, there was, you know, they said, hey, you know what? We can go out there, we can kill them all, or we can just share the aloha and kill them with aloha. And so I remember that finally in you know, my, my later years in returning to surfing. And I realized if I have a, that aloha, it's a way of educating, right? And so I went from being a gangster to an educator like Isaiah. So I take the long walk and, you know, I go through college and I get all my degrees too. But in the end, I find that the University of Hawaii or Hawaii isn't providing the platform I need. So we start our own nonprofit, which allows us to be here today, right? Myself one, you know, because it's, it's about education. And if you don't educate the world, you only create enemies. And the whole principle of what we as native peoples are doing in our anger is to create friends. Because that was the last wish of our queen, right? Build friendship, and out of the friendship, you resolve the issue, and, you, and you, everybody learns humility. 
and to be respectful for one another. So when you come to Hawaii, be respectful, because we're, you know, we, we are respectful to here. Because I met all, you know, the guys of Santa Cruz, right? The heavies. And it's, it's their place, and I respect them for it. I mean, anywhere I go in the world, I never walk into the ocean or the water without meeting the guys and technically asking permission. Do you mind? Right? And I carry that with me. And it's something that we should all learn. And, and the egos that run in the professional surfing world today is rampant. They lack that, and it's growing again. We see it. We see it. I don't even drive to the North Shore. I drive my jet ski to the North Shore and hide out because I can go places that everybody just wants to have their camera right there. There's a camera for, right Sam? There's a camera for every guy surfing nowadays out there. And we all know that. So there's, there's a lot to be said. And are you from Samoa? Are you from Samoa or are you descendant of Samoa? Because that brought to mind what happened to Margaret Mead, you know, a professor. So she wrote the book. You know, she wrote a book about Samoan culture. And what she finds out years later is that it was a joke because the Samoan people, they were insulted by what she was doing. And, you know, they wouldn't validate that, that whole work of hers and, that, and the printing of her book. They, 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 they openly said that was all, all make-believe just for you because you, you wanted to label us as this. And so Margaret Mead lost her standing academically because of that. So, and then we talked about, you know, getting out there and sharing things with the native peoples of, you know, that reminded me of another book, book, Cargo Culture, right? So if you guys haven't read that, you should read Cargo, Cargo Culture. There's also a documentary on it. And the other one is Orientalism. Orientalism is the thing that we break every day because we don't want to be the other. It's a description of who we are, and I think Isaiah put something like that up there. The boys were talking about it in the hui. Is this idea of we see ourselves as the other, and that's where my anger originated from because I was taught to be ashamed of myself as a, as a young boy. And I was taught to be, I had to be white. And I wanted everything white. I hated being a, a native person. But I realized that Hey, I am who I am, I did what I did, and life just goes on. And you know what? In the surfing industry, very few people get second chances. And though I'm a product of that surfing industry, I'm not controlled by that industry. You know, I wouldn't be here because there's a lot of other guys out there that should be here, but I'm here because maybe my resistance to the surfing industry, I don't know. I can't figure it out. I ask myself that every day. I even look at Isaiah. I was like, I don't know. But, you know, my effort today is to let you know I'm a very angry person, but that's okay. Who cares? I have a lot of aloha because everybody that's met me, right? We're just laughing, having fun. It's like, you know, I don't bring racism into it at all. It's just the idea of us, you know, we're all one family, no matter what we are because the planet is our, is our home. And that's all I gotta say. Okay, white guy, your turn. <laughs> wow. As you can see, the passion, the emotion, the feeling, the reality of this whole thing, you know, it just, uh, the subject is really heavy. It's, it's amazing. Um, I've traveled all over the world, and I've felt this, the negativity of localism everywhere because of this, because of this, because of this, whatever. And uh, a lot of it, uh, you know, is, it's all about disrespect. You know, I just, I lived in Hawaii for a couple of years. I went over there, and uh, I was very respectful. Yes, you were, Bob. I mean, I just, I was very respectful. I just... Uh, when I'd walk to my house, there are certain people who didn't want me to say hi to them, so I wouldn't say hi to them. I'd just ignore them. But I'd let them know with a little, like this, that, that 
If they want to say hi to me someday, I'll say hi to them. Uh, when I went to the beach, some guy was throwing a net out. I didn't walk close to him. I didn't go ask him what he's doing. I stay out of his way, stay out of his face, walked around. Some other Howley would come by. Hey, what are you doing? What is this? Next thing you know, he'd say, I'm fishing here. Get the hell out of my way. And disrespecting who he was, where he was, what's going on. When I paddled out, I'd paddle out. I'd stay away from here. I'd move closer and closer and closer and try to pick up the vibe, see what it's about. And if these guys smiled to me, then I'd move a little closer. I wouldn't take a wave yet. I'd let them have a wave. I'd praise them, whatever. Just Then they'd say, hey, take a wave. I'd take a wave. Then I established myself. They saw I was a respect, so then it was a good thing. So I f fit in. Took me a while, but I fit in. Next thing you know, I was accepted over there. And I was just a regular guy. I d gave them respect, they gave it right back. It was no worries. Um, the heaviest place I've ever been was Guam. Uh, over there, I, I spent some time over there and it was really difficult to fit in. There was, there was an attitude, there was a, a thing going on there. And, uh, but after a while, I fit in. Around here, it's disrespect. When you drive your car down the road, it's respecting. Some guy cuts in front of you, you get angry at him. Who's this jerk? It's the same thing as surfing. You know, you don't pull in front of a guy. You don't run him off the road. You don't flip him off. You don't do this. You treat him with respect. And all around the world, you've got Majority of people in this world, I think, are good people. But there's that barking dog who goes out there and creates a problem. You go surf the lane. I surf the lane every day. I know damn near everybody out there, and everybody's smiling, right? Everybody's having a good time. We were out there the other day surfing. One guy paddled up with a little attitude, started barking at people, kind of ruined the vibe. Is he a local? Yeah. Do the locals like him? No, we don't like him. He wrecks the surf. Do people think he's a local? Yeah. Do they think we like him? Yeah. We don't. We don't like the guy. And that's the way it is. You know, the rude driver, you don't like him. The rude guy in the water, we don't like him. Do we talk to these guys? Yeah. You know, a good buddy of mine, Roger Adams, one of the best surfers in this world ever. In the 60s, he just did things no one did. Around the 70s, 80s, it started getting crowded. He just had enough, phased out. Phased out. 20 years later, he's out at the lane one day, and I'm going, seeing my good friend Roger Adams, who's better than anybody, great attitude, great person, surfing. Some little local kid who's been surfing for a year and a half thinks he owns the place, right? And we, we're schooling him, we're schooling, hey, don't, don't, don't. Tells Roger to go back to the valley, kook. You know, Roger was offended, hurt, and he goes, yeah, I'm out of here. I'm going to quit surfing. And I pedal, no, 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 no. Let me go talk to this little guy. So I talked to the guy, a little lectured, and this little guy had respect for me. And so now he listened, and I said, no, go apologize to Roger. But Roger's session was kind of ruined, you know. It's, this is the, the localism thing. And, and I always tell people, I just don't phase out. Stay there. Get there. Phase these other idiots out. You know, they need to go away. And the majority of people out there are good people. And that's a good thing. You know, locals. I hear, oh, you know, you know, lanes heavy, heavy locals. <laughs> Jeez, no, it's not. I know everybody out there. You know, one or two jerks that bark loud, but they're not to worry, you know, about those, you know. Um, Frosty, uh, I wasn't going to talk here. Frosty was going to do this. And Tom, you said the words, kill him with aloha. That's who Frosty is. He would just, that's it, kill him with aloha. Just, you know, some guy used to attitude, hey, you know, just, uh, that just, and that's, that's the idea, kill him with aloha. It makes you a better person, and you accept it, and you can handle it better if you do that, you know? Um, it's all about respect, localism. It's real, it's out there. It's going to be out there forever, because there's a lot of rude people in this world, but most people are good people, so. Yes. You're native. <laughs> You're a native. No need, Mike. No, nah, I'm teasing. No. Having fun. I need a cold beer. Testing. Uh, thank you so much for uh, all your presentations. Uh, my question is for the panelists, including Trey. Uh, this panel is uh, called Deconstructing, uh, Deconstructing Localism. 
So in thinking about localism and indigeneity, I find it very ironic that none of us in this room acknowledge the Olone people, the indigenous people of Santa Cruz. So in thinking about that, Dre, I was just wondering if you can please tell me about what your concept of localism is when you put together this panel. That's true. I got it. Don't worry. No, no. Trey, Trey. She asked Trey. Go ahead, Bob, and I'll follow you up. I, I didn't have every word, so no, go. Oh, come on. Don't, don't try to skip out of this one, Trey. She asked that, That's a really excellent question. Uh, to which I feel underprepared to answer. To be honest with you, I have no idea of the Ohlone people surfing if they did at that time, and that's something I, I should. It is their land, it is their ocean. Yeah. When I put this panel together, it sort of came out of my own personal experiences having worked as a surf guide in Indonesia and Central America. Some of the things that had happened to me there, particularly. Um, you know, one of the heaviest experiences I had was while I was living in Bali, and I had taken a boat full of guests out to a place called um, Airport Lefts, and we had been surfing, Then this is a very popular spot, it's one of those places where people pay like five bucks to take a, a water taxi, more or less out there, and then the water taxi will stay and shoot photos and, and whatever else. And there was a bit of um, animosity, I guess, towards me because I was a foreign guide there weren't a lot of foreign guides at, at that time. And although I was working with uh, fellow Javanese, or excuse me, Balinese guides at that time, some of the uh, local guides from other companies felt that I was displacing their friends or something like that, taking, taking jobs from them. And one of these guys had been sitting on the boat all day and he paddled out. And his first wave, he just blatantly dropped in on me which I don't really have a problem with. I thought we could surf the wave together type of thing. And, you know, he did his top turn and I followed him and he, I sort of came right down into him. He was, he was still in the pocket. And we popped up and I was just sort of smiling about it. You know, it's these, these things sort of, sort of happen. And he just sort of attacked me um, straight away. So that was something that, that I, was, I wasn't used to. Um, and... You know, especially usually the the words words come before the fist, and that wasn't the the poise, the, the excuse me the, the case in point here. Um, I know I'm not specifically addressing your question with with this anecdote. I, I realize that. But but can I step in on that question because past few years um, I've been working with American Indians. Uh, yeah, we were invited up to Lake Tahoe uh, about three years ago to participate or to encourage the reinstitutionalization of American Native culture through ours. And so we shared with them uh, the first year, it was only the Washoes that came. Uh, and then eventually the second year, we had kids come from all over California and Nevada. And then by the third year, we had, we had American Indians groups coming from California, Nevada, Tahoe, Arizona, Canada, and we're all sharing in this reinstitutionalization of traditions. And so what's going on here, I'm not exactly sure where they're taking themselves, but, they're, but what was voiced in the, in, the, in the gatherings in the evening was their sense of not knowing who they were to begin with, you know. Yes, I understand that. But I'm kind of thinking, you know, Isaiah, when you talked about, uh, you know, one of the, th uh, the three princes that introduced the art form of surfing in Santa Cruz, I wonder if the three princes were in consultation with the Olone people before they actually shared this art form on this land of Olone people, because if not, then it's a, another form of reinforcing colonialism. I don't know if I'd say that's reinforcing colonialism because they're coming here and surfing. How is that a reinforcement of colonialism? Well, when the three princes came to introduce the yeah, art I know the of story, surfing, but right? how is it so, colonization? So, I mean, how... I mean, well, before they surfed on their land, don't you think that they should have asked the local Ohlone people they, 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 they could actually do it? Actually, Hawaiians have had a long-standing relationship with 
native peoples over here. If you drive up along the Pacific Coast Highway, there's a lot of names that are actually Hawaiian towns. They pronounce them improperly. Uh, but there has been this long tradition of healthy interactions between the Native American, the Native peoples all up, all up along this coast. In fact, in Hawaii, we have a traditional dish that's on every luau plate. It's called lomi salmon. It's yep. made up of salmon, tomato, and onions, none of which are from Hawaii. Yeah. And I they guess come what from I'm interested in is the, is the conversation, the intertribal uh, uh -huh. conversation that I think that is lacking. Uh, you know, in this topic of, you know, we talk about surf culture, indigeneity, we don't have a uh, Ohlone representative. Oh. Um, well, you know, I'm point. sorry, you know, if I was a little bit naive about what you just talked about before, about, you know, there are certain places in, no, around fine. here that, uh, that, you know, misspell uh, Hawaiian uh -huh. names. But uh, I just think that, you know, if we're talking about indigeneity and indigenous people and we're not actually acknowledging the indigenous I people of Santa why. Cruz, then I think we're just missing the whole point. That's what I think. Uh, yeah. No, Sam, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1880. One thing you want, might want to keep in mind is that by the time that those princes were going to school here, it was the late 1800s, by that time, yeah. the local indigenous people were almost extinct here. Yes. I mean, from the late 1700s up until that time, through the mission system, through the decimation, through diseases, the Santa Cruz was an industrial town. There was no, indu there was no indigenous culture here. It is a university. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you would have to go back to the, to the, you'd have to go back to the Jesuits and the Franciscans. Okay, yeah. we, so, so I'm going to go back to what we've been doing with, with, with the American Indians. Uh, we were invited here, and that was part of what we, you know, I couldn't figure out, pardon? No, not to Santa Cruz, but by the American Indians as a larger group of this continent. I mean, Hawaiians have always been involved from the first uh, trading ships that arrived in Hawaii and bought Native Hawaiians to this continent, because we we had us we we were sent out in the in the uh, late 1700s for the purpose of connecting with the peoples of this land. So a lot of Native Hawaiians never returned. They married into you know Native American tribes, and they're and and they're spread out across all of America. And we've had a long association with the American Indians. And four years ago, I started an association with Nike through the American Indians uh, Tribal uh, Council that the Hawaiian people have become part of now. And they've, you know, we've been part of it for a long time. And so Nike started Nike N7, right? And that was pushed forward by the Council of American Indians who, who created an association with Nike to, to perpetuate uh, native cultures of, of America. And so we've been pretty much part of that, or at least I have. And as far as surfing in Santa Cruz, no. You know, we've, I, I've never surfed with or and been associated with in that sense. But we have constructed, we have, we have made contact. We are working with various, you know, Native Americans up and down this coast, because this is just one tribe. There's many tribes. And with that, but what we have been doing is the Washoe Indians are sort of the ones that brought this together. And so everybody meets in Lake Tahoe, and we build surfboards there, we build canoes there, you know, I mean, we build all kind of things together there, paddles, doesn't matter, but we share our cultures not only physically but intellectually. And so, yes, we are in definitely contact. I mean, because we're, they're trying to avoid, you know, they're, they're trying to re educate themselves. There's a difference between us and them. Like, we look to the Maori of Aotearoa because we always say they are 20 years ahead of us in the sense of being a native, because we were so assimilated. Well, 
I'm not speaking of myself, I'm speaking of maybe my grandparents and my great grandparents, they were very assimilated. But, you know, the American Indians are not all the tribes see themselves as they need to be re educated, re in touch with their practices and traditions again. And so we're just help in helping them by invitation. Other than that, we wouldn't even, you know, be, be part of the, you know, you know, the movement of the Native peoples anywhere. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, can I just make one final comment on this note? And I know we're kind of dragging this out, but I did want to point out um, that the Native American occupation of Alcatraz in the late 60s, um, I feel was sort of a direct antecedent to the, the occupation, the Native Hawaiian occupation of Kohalawe and that movement as well. So I think those connections did are- Did you learn that in my book? Did yes, I? you did. Yeah, I probably did. <laughs> Okay, you're out. Cre you cre credit credit where that. it's due. But um, I would also like to say that um, the, uh, the lack of an Ohlone presence on the panel or even the consideration of that is something that I take full responsibility for as organizer of this panel. Hey, there's somebody up there. There was somebody before you. I, you know, I got to hear him out. Come on, let's go. Yeah, give it up. Isaiah, that's good. It is Isaiah. <laughs> no, good. You know what? What is really like a step? Like, how does a surfer come to a new place? And just, I mean, tell him. Don't, don't leave. Thank you, bud. Sorry, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your comment. I do. Yeah. I think I think oh yeah. I think we've we've sort of each of us have addressed that in one way or another. But I mean, we all had different stories. Of, I mean, Bob was talking about just taking your turn in the lineup and just assessing the situation, which most people do not take that time to assess. And then um, the reason why I showed that clip from, uh, from Stuart Hall, he was talking about recognition and that there's no recognition going on between the slave and the slave master, that they're ignoring each other. We, we do that all too much these days. Talking to people, so simple. But I'm surprised how quiet it is in the surf these days. When I was a kid, everybody talked story. You know, you'd see somebody catch a wave, you'd be like, whoo! There's no hooting going on anymore. We don't recognize other people. We see them on a wave instead of like enjoying the moment with them. Uh, we just want what they have, which I guess goes back to supporting Sam's point here of this concept but, that he has. But talk to people, say hi. Um, the, the more you just communicate, pretty simple. Yeah, it's like Isaiah said, you just show respect. You show your, the, the awareness that you acknowledge they exist. You know, if, if you paddle close to them, but you're not invading their space, and then they see that you're doing this, they go, oh, this guy's aware we're here. So he has some respect. And then if he looks at you and kind of nod at him, say hi, without bothering him, then he goes, oh, he's got more respect. And it's been a little time developing that respect. Next thing you know, these guys, most everybody will say, hey, come over, get a wave. They like you. The opposite would be paddling up there aggressively, paddling around the lineup like the guy did to him and his son the other day. I mean, that's rude as hell. You know, he's sitting here with his son. It's their turn. And some guy gets around, paddles over to the other side. Now he's in the pole position. That's rude as hell. You know, and nobody likes that. You don't like it because they're going to take your way, but you don't like that because there's disrespect. You know, it's that strong disrespect. It's rude as hell. 
Correct. Okay, no, it's, a, it's, it's an easy answer. It's, it's a really easy answer. And the thing is, is that most people, they believe they're good. Then there's people who have this sense of calmness about themselves, and they know they're good. And they paddle straight to the top of the lineup, straight to the guys that are at the top, and they ask them, hey, how's the surf? And then, you know, everybody goes, oh, not bad. And they all look at you. And, you know, I always make one move higher. But you know what? I turn around, I look at everybody, I look at the surf coming, and I, just, I, and I go, are you going? And if they go, if they paddle, I, I don't paddle. But if they say, oh, I, I'm on it, and that's that. And then I come back and I go, you know, I don't, I don't paddle around them. I sit and wait my turn. But if you're lacking in the lineup, I'll dominate it, period, even today. It's just my attitude. And I show up, but if the first thing I'm going to do is give you respect. And after I catch my wave, I'm going to come back and I'm going to sit there and let you catch your wave, right? If you don't pick off that wave or you miss four in a row, three in a row, you're out. I don't care where I am, you're out, because I'm going to go. <laughs> and that's that. Thank you, guys. Quick question. Okay, so let's, let's drop down to, to this guy. Uh, thank you guys. Um, appreciate what you guys have to say on localism. Um, I, my name's Jack, I grew up surfing here, surfed here my whole life, and um, I've seen a lot of localism in town, and actually not as much as I hear about it. Of course, it's blown out of proportion, and when localism happens, it seems, it seems like everyone talks about it, and it's more of an issue than it really is. But um, what, what I see in, in lineup when, when things, you know, if there's an unsafe surfer in, in a spot, you know, where they're surfing, they'll, they'll be asked to leave. Or if, um, if I'm surfing my favorite spot and I'm not catching my waves because someone else from not here is surfing on my waves is what I'm thinking, I'm getting greedy and I'll freak out on them or tell them to leave. Um, I try not to, I, as much as possible, I understand that the ocean is for everyone to play in and um, as long as everything's going safe and, and meshing, I'm totally okay with that. But then I see other localism and I think how disgusting is that is. I see other people telling other people to leave the, the ocean. And I, I have a disagreement with that. Um, but I'm not a very confrontational person. So my question is to you, if you're out surfing and you see someone being a dick and telling people to leave and, and cussing them out, what do you say to them, if anything? <laughs> That, that takes courage. I've seen that before. One time I was surfing out at Rocky Point last year. There was this big local dude and some guy who probably didn't belong out there, didn't really know what he was doing, got in his way. And like, it, it, was, it was pretty dangerous. Guy like, ate it and their boards like wrapped up together. And as, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I felt sorry for the guy because I knew what was coming. Sure enough, he started paddling up to him, and like, he was like, what, bro, I'm going to freaking kill you, cuz. He was paddling up to him, and this other local brother charged straight at him, like got in his face and, what? And these, these two bulls, like, staring at each other, and it, the guy had to sort of snap out of it, and he's like, bro, take it easy. Mellow out. We don't like any of that over here. So it was this moment of where, and I was like, really grateful for this other local guy that sort of saved this dude's life. And I think even the local guy eventually appreciated it. It was like, oh, uncle, sorry, bro, you know. And I learned from that, and I, I tried to, I've done that a few times myself recently, or I saw these two local guys ready to scrap each other, and I jumped in, I was like, bro, how big are the waves right now? Two feet? Shut up then, it's not worth it. And they you know, just kind of snap out of it. But unfortunately, we, we're, we're kind of in a crisis. When people say they have fun surfing, I don't know. It's not always fun anymore. And I think we have to evaluate what's going on. And if we kind of change our consciousness, then maybe it'll change. But it's, it's hard. I've tried that like myself. Like I've been thinking about this all month coming up to here. And I surfed VLAN the other day. And I was like, OK, I'm going to apply all the things I've been thinking about. I'm just gonna sit on the side, I'm gonna try and just find joy and you know, talk to people, get a good vibe. And sure enough, these 
guys on soft tops come paddle out and start pat catching waves around me. And I was like, okay, I'll just, I was like, try and talk to them. And then next thing you know, I'm like, frick, I'm just gonna paddle around them too, you know? It's hard. I don't have all the answers, but I think we all have to change our sense of consciousness somehow and start, I think the more that we are aware, that we'll start being more um, polite and maybe, you know, figure things out. A way, you know, a way around, you know, working in the lineup is that, you know, because like when I came back to surfing, I realized I didn't have to be the front guy. I don't have a problem surfing behind you because the fact of the matter is that surfing behind you meant I had to be more on it than you because I was tighter. So everything I did there, I had to hone my skills. I had to be better. I just had to be better because it wasn't me surfing against you. It's me surviving the wave. And that, you know, and so if you dropped in on me, I don't yell. That's number one rule in my book. I don't, I don't go, hey, you know, I don't, no sound. There's no sound for me. You drop in, you just better be on it because I'm, I'm on you and I'm going to surf your line and my line together and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I do best and what I love to do, right? And so it doesn't matter. And sometimes I don't make the wave, but that's okay because you know why? I took off on the wave, I got it, I'm happy and I paddle right back out and I don't give anybody attitude. I just go, yeah, whatever. But if you keep doing it, you know, the whole time. I'm going to paddle over and just say, look, we're having a nice day. Are you having a nice day? Don't you want to have a nice day? Me too. So let's have a nice day. And I paddle on. And that's, that's all. And, I, you know, they get the, bet, you know, the, the point. is like, yeah, we don't want to have an argument because I don't, I don't talk much in the water. I mean, anybody that knows me, all my best friends, it doesn't matter. If we're surfing together, I don't talk to them. I don't talk to anybody. I kind of have my own space and my own lineup. And that's where I stay. I paddle past everybody coming out. I go, hey, how's it? Everybody's laughing. And they all look at me like, eh, just him. And he just, I just paddle on. And I sit in my own space. It's like I'm, I tune everybody out. And there's just me and the ocean. And that's that. But I'm respectful for everybody else because it's so crowded. I mean, how many of you have been to Hawaii recently? It is so crowded every winter. It's packed. It's crazy. All right, I think we have, was there one last comment? What everybody was saying, like when you're trying to think of the lineup and, and how to handle that, but I mean, doesn't the, the community that li lives at each spot in each, like, you know, Santa Cruz, whether it's the lane or, or whatever break, or in my case, whether it's Lowers or Salt Creek or, you know, for you guys, and, you know, Pipe or Rocky Point or wherever, you know, every spot has a, a group of people that surf there pretty much all the time. And as the older crowd, I mean, I kind of look at it, if somebody's older than me, they've been surfing there longer than me, they're going. You know, I don't count. I'm paddling over it. Uh, or if I'm at a spot that I'm not a local at, you know, I'm, I'm in some sort of line that, you know, if I get to go ahead to go, I'm going, it's great. But then, I mean, I feel, I don't know if you guys feel that the community itself that's in the lineup needs to step up and regulate, uh, kind of like you were saying, setting the little kids straight. I mean, I have to do that all the time back home. Uh, and I'm not even, I don't even feel like I'm a local in San Clemente. I mean, I've only been there, what, 18 years, but I'm originally from South Carolina. So I'm not a local anywhere anymore. So, I, but the, the, the community itself should step up and, sit, and some kid gets out of line, you say, hey man, you're, you, you don't act like that. That guy here, he's been yes, surfing here his whole life. Um, but just, and it's a good uh, analogy for just life in general around town. I mean, it doesn't seem like the community is allowed to step up and set kids straight or, or some drunk guy in the street acting like a jerk, you know, the community or somebody in there just needs to be able to, hey man, you don't, what are you doing? You don't act like that. And the community is better for it. I mean, do you see that happening? Because I see it in some places. That's exactly places. what it is. We had an older guy in this town, Sam Reed. Uh, he's a famous guy, surfed for the Duke. And he posted rules and had these boards put up of the rules, etiquettes of surfing. 
And so if you enter the lane in a few places, there's the etiquette of surfing. It's just treat each other with respect and paddle around. Don't paddle through the lineups. There's a guy on a wave has to surf around you. You paddle around, take your turn, stuff like that. And that is, it's each territory, each, wherever you are, you have the, the elders trying to teach the young guys. I'm going to say one thing, and then I'm stepping off this panel. Okay, to your question or your comment, Drew, you're a product of your environment. That's what we are. We're a product of our environment. And, you know, I'm not laying blame to anything because it actually starts in our own home that education is so important, especially with the young kids coming up. You know, yeah, I think there's a lack of education. And I think I don't use the word regulate because I don't like regulations to begin with, but education. And, you know, yeah, to get all this money and... and, and Sam is, is aware of it. Most of you are aware of that. You know, a lot of the young kids, man, sponsored, you know, they're not just given clothes anymore or a board. They're, they're given a lot of money and everything else, and they become products of that environment. And, it's, yeah, it's a sad thing. And you got to learn to understand that. So I'm done. I love you guys. Make it a law, no? Mm.